Hello, welcome to this video based on an online event for the Novia weekend course on Renaissance music. you've presented a lot of information of which some might be new for uh, some of the students and there might be questions arising like OMG how much should I now study how how in depth should one understand all of this you are doing I, I suppose myself that this is indeed an introduction so you are presenting us what there is and then we will uh, practically do things and this is as as the whole Novia course in a way this is the beginning of the rest of our lives so then we can use as much time as we want to study more in depth and go to our personal directions. Absolutely I love your philosophy of this is the beginning of the rest of our lives because like any worthwhile field of study historically informed performance can occupy the whole of your life and musical career and we all have to make choices about um, how broad our study will be and how deep it will be and what I'm setting out very much as you just said this is a broad overview I'm trying to show you not so much to show you what the answers are I'm trying to show you where the important questions are where are the things that might look like we already understand them but actually they're working differently so we need to be questioning and perhaps that's the most important thing about early music in general is to keep that questioning attitude we should always be on the lookout that we think we understand something because it perhaps looks like what we're used to in later music we think we understand something but perhaps we don't at all and the only way we can find out is by challenging our assumptions and checking what the older assumptions were back in the time and that's very much what i'm trying to do is just set out the important questions that you might want to go into in terms of preparing for the weekend course that's coming up in a certain way none of this is actually needed to enjoy that weekend and to benefit from that weekend this is the theoretical background to what we're going to do in a purely practical way at the weekend course and for the weekend course I've provided modern scores of everything so that um, we can work from modern scores for convenience but I've also provided the original materials for those who want to start comparing them and wondering about the relationship between what we assume and what they assume when you see the notation so in this second part we've looked at the notation what's written and given to us from the past and now we're looking at performance, what we're going to do with that as performance. And again, here is a, a long shopping list of concepts, of ideas that were important to them that we can explore gradually in increasing depth. Perhaps the most important concept is shown in the picture here, which is that we need to alter our viewpoint. I said earlier, we didn't want to be like historians looking backwards into history. We wanted to align ourselves with the performers and composers and be moving forwards in time with them. And similarly, we want to realign our viewpoint so that we're not only thinking as performers from our own point of view, but we're thinking of the audiences for whom we perform this music. What are they getting from all of this? And that's a vital shift of perspective that we really need to make. So we begin with rhetoric. The 
art of speech making, the art of persuasion. It's a buzzword in today's early music and we could spend a lot of time studying this and I do encourage you to study a bit further the idea of rhetoric. The aims of rhetoric to teach, to explain, to communicate clearly what I'm trying to do now. Another aim of rhetoric to delight the audience and the third aim to move their feelings, to change their emotions. The historical phrase was to move the passions. The five canons of rhetoric about how you organize your performance in advance, inventing the basic idea, organizing your material, deciding what the style is going to be, committing it all to memory, or at least studying it until you're totally familiar with it, and finally performance itself which they divided into delivery, how you pronounce the sounds, the words, the musical sounds, and action, everything else, what you do emotionally, what you do with your hand gestures, everything other than the actual, just the raw sounds that you're making. A very important principle of rhetoric, the principle of decorum, that everything fits together. Unlike modern opera, where the stage story may be completely different from what is in the music and the words, but in the late Renaissance, decorum, everything fits together perfectly. When we say that music was a rhetorical art, which it certainly was, art means that it's a set of organising principles, and rhetorical means that music is based on text. Tactus. We've talked about how Tactus interacts with notation. This is how it's done in performance. The boy there is not a recorder player, he's a singer. And he's learning his music, um, which is in the book on the table in front of him. And with one hand he's beating Tactus and that gives life to the raw notation of the note values. So his Tactus hand organises the rhythm, and the little recorder in his other hand just helps him check the pitches when he needs. And what is the character of this Tactus beating? It's regular, solid, stable, firm, clear, sure, fearless, and without any perturbation. I think most of us working musicians can notice that that's rather different from modern conducting. now on this idea of pronouncing the music and that music is based on text. So we're pronouncing words. Even if we're playing an instrument, we want our instrumental music to sound rhetorical, to sound as if it has text. Nowadays we talk about the idea of articulation, how we start, how we join together and how we separate words or indeed musical notes. Very important idea of good and bad syllables. We'll be using this a lot at the weekend course. So in the Italian language, every word has a good syllable. Piano, forte, dolce, arpa, roma, and so on. Two syllable words nearly always have this pattern, and that's the sound of Italian music. A good note joined to a bad note. Longer words have more varied patterns, so we have staccato and legato. Notice that the single and double consonants make the word staccato sound staccato, and legato sounds legato. Soprano has the same pattern, three syllables, with the good one in the middle. Again, we finish up good-bad, so the last is bad. There's another pattern for three-syllable words. Organo, tavola, the table. Ultimo, the last. Again, they end with a bad syllable. And another important idea of articulation, joining and separating, is the idea of sense groups. When I say a few words, 
at a time, I can break them into small sense groups. And that is the way that I would speak if I was speaking without microphone to perhaps a thousand people in a big hall. That's the rhetorical way of speaking, breaking up one sentence into short sense groups. And that's what we do with the music too. Modes. Now this is a vast area of theoretical study that we're going to study in a practical way to get the modes into your hands and voices and ears, not only into your brains. But very quickly, the modes are defined by the notes they finish on, because many tunes don't actually start on the, as it were, the keynote of the mode. They could start anywhere, but they tend to finish on the important note. And so the important note of a mode is called the finalis, in English the final. So how do we find out which mode we're in? We look at the last note. And in chant, the modes are these particular scales, but also characteristic melodic figures. There are different little bits of tune associated with particular modes. Each mode has an emotional character. Historical sources disagree about which character was which, but there is a feeling, just as we have the feeling that major and minor have a different emotional character. They thought that each of their modes had a different character. And it was possible to mix modes, especially to mix, looking at the diagram, the one from the top line with the corresponding one from the bottom line, which extended the range of your melody. In Renaissance polyphony, the modes, yes, they give you a scale. You might sometimes go out of that scale with so-called musica ficta, fake notes, like sharps. Sharps are fake. They're not the real thing. We throw them in just sometimes, but they're somehow not part of that theoretical system that we looked at before. So there are certain notes that belong to the mode, but in polyphony, we're especially concerned with the typical cadences for each mode. There's an idea that the modes have particular emotional characters and again you can mix modes and the importance of mixing the modes now is to give you a choice of more cadence options. This is something very important for the structure of the music and for the emotions in the music, dissonance. And we've all learnt, um, probably as children, um, in our basic music theory, how do you make a dissonance? Well, there's a preparation, there's the dissonance itself, and there's resolution. And this is not just theory. We need to be aware of this in performance. So as we sing the preparation note, we're showing it to the audience. Look, audience, this note is going to become important. As we hit the dissonance, we feel the emotional charge and the particular flavor of that dissonance with the words that it is attached to. And then resolution, ah, the emotional crisis has passed. We relax a mo for a moment. This is related to the idea of cadences. Cadences are very important for Renaissance music. There are three cadence melodies that we come across very often. The soprano one goes, for example, G, F sharp, G. We recognize this as a cadence. We can also see that there might be some punctuation in the words. There might be a rest afterwards. There might be a full stop in the words, then will be other indications that we're coming to the end of something. In Renaissance music, you make a cadence to finish something, and when you have a cadence, something is finished. Endings and cadences are absolutely joined. The tenor cadence falls by one note, for example, A, G, and the bass cadence, which becomes increasingly important as the bass part really becomes something special. I've talked about equal voice polyphony, where in principle all the 
voices are equally important and very similar, but the bass imp part becomes increasingly different and important in its own way of making the bass, and it has its own cadence, typically falling a fifth. D, G. So we recognise those elements of the cadence. We're used to combining them in a single harmonic event that we call a cadence. We'll see in Renaissance music that they liked to overlap the cadences. So one or two voices might make a cadence, but another voice or uh, several voices might not. And so we need to recognise cadences not just as a total event, but also voice by voice. Other important elements for intensifying the emotions in our music, suspensions. When you hold a note over, typically it's going to become a dissonance as you hold the note in a modern edition across the bar line. In original sources, there won't be a bar line, but you'll spot that long held note on a good syllable. Typically, you want to crescendo those, and Caccini says that one of the most emotional things there is, is that crescendo on a single note. Another element of passionate music making is contrasting note values. They tend to increase the contrast in note values as they increase the emotional intensity. And Caccini, again, he's writing just in the first years of the 17th century, but his book is summing up the developments of the previous decades. And he's telling us, exaggerate contrast in note values. Rather contrary to the tendency of modern performers to take the easy way out, to smooth everything out and, you know, underplay contrast in note values. No, Caccini says exaggerate. So the whole topic of emotions, as you will have guessed by now, they thought about it differently back then. The past is a foreign country. The Italian word that comes closest to our modern idea of emotions is affetti. The affections of the soul, as Aristotle called it. Again, we're going back to very ancient ideas. In this case, ideas of medicine, how the human being, mind, body and spirit, reacts to what we would nowadays call emotional stimulation, to emotional changes. And they thought of the vast range of possible emotions as mapped out with four basic directions. It's not to say these are the only emotions, but rather like the directions north, south, east and west help you orient on the map. So these so-called four humours help you understand the general direction of the emotional content. And each of these four humours, it's an emotional affect, we use this German word affect, which is very close to the Italian word affetto, plural affetti. Each of these four humours is associated with a particular affect and with a particular part of the body and some liquid in the body which is responding emotionally. So the sanguine humour, it's the blood flowing outwards from the heart. They didn't think of a circulatory system, by the way. They thought of the, the blood flowing out and flowing back in from and back to the heart, not round and round. So the sanguine humour, the red blood, comes out from your heart, warm and liquid, and spreads through the whole body. Your face maybe goes a little flushed. It's the emotions of love, courage and hope. It's an outward emotion, and it feels warm and liquid. The choleric humour is anger. It's associated with fire, thirst. It's hot and dry. 
It's I want a strong drink. Whereas the sanguine humour would be I offer you a glass of red wine and some fine music and some good company. All those nice things are part of the sanguine humour. Perhaps you know the Renaissance picture of a violinist leaning out from a balcony and offering a glass of red wine. That is everything about the sanguine humour. But the choleric is anger, desire, which is not the same thing as love, fire. It's outward going, but it's hot and dry. The melancholy humour, we hear a lot about melancholy, especially in English Renaissance music, John Dowland. Melancholy, yes, it's sad, it's also unhappy in love, it's staying up too late and not getting enough sleep, it's thinking too much, it's studying too much. We, in our studies, have a tendency to become melancholy. That's an inward directed humour, it's cold and dry, and it's symbolised by black bile from the liver, whereas the choleric humour was yellow bile from the spleen. And last, the phlegmatic humour, cold and wet. Imagine you've been standing under a cold shower all day, and it's symbolised by phlegm, that green mucus that fills you up when you have a cold or flu. And you just feel completely uh, and you can't do anything. That's the phlegmatic humour. And the idea of muovere gli affetti, to move the passions, is that Renaissance and early Baroque music changes quickly and often from one emotion to a contrasting one, quite different from romantic music, which tends to emphasise one particular emotion until it overwhelms you. The emotional effect we're looking for in early music is changes, and it's not about what we feel, it's about the audience. So we want the audience's affetti to be changed. We want to muovere gli affetti, move the passions of the audience. Dance, huge topic, lots to study. Go and join a Renaissance dance group and do those movements. Great fun and you'll learn something about music you'll, you'll never learn any other way. Dance symbolises the perfect movement of the stars and planets. Ah, we've met that before. Dance was not only performance, it was social activity, and many of the early music dramas involve the audience in social dancing as it goes along. There are particular dance types, we'll study those practically. Pavan and Galliard, particularly important. Contrasting dance types were linked together into a ballo. Again, not necessarily a performance dance, but there were social dances that mixed and contrasted several different dance types. And yes, dancing became a big part of theatrical music. Theatrical music, the magical dialogue. So perhaps six or seven singers might represent two people having a dialogue. It's not a very direct way of representing, but it is dramatic and it was very important in the period. And then intermedi, I already mentioned, very complex, very expensive music, drama and dance entertainments in the intervals of a spoken play. And here's a picture from the 1589 intermedi. We'll be studying this piece. And just look at the huge stage set with th four different cloud machines going up and down, lots of singers on each cloud. This is a huge and expensive and complex stage set. And the music, as I previously mentioned, we're normally thinking of one to a part, but this is um, five part music with a vast number of performers separated into spatially separated ensembles. 
but in the previous piece they have 30 individual parts, actually the more typical Renaissance approach to large numbers. Here's another vast subject and a hot topic in today's early music performance, gesture. It's rhetorical, in other words it's based on text. The gestures are not a kind of hand ballet just to look pretty, though they do look very nice, but they're based on text. They're supposed to communicate, delight the eye, yes, but especially they're supposed to move the passions. Gesture is not just your hands, it's also the face and the eyes and the whole body. We'll be doing some of that on our weekend course. Composer performer, so two of our famous composers and theorists of the early 1600s, Jacopo Peri and Giulio Caccini, were active in the previous decades as performers and there is Jacopo Peri with his harp in his costume for those Florentine intermedi of 1589, which we will be studying. Composers are also performers. In our weekend course we'll only touch on this, it's something you'll go into in more detail later on, but a really vital idea that the performers are also inventing their own ornamentation, two essential ways of doing that. Passaggi take longer notes and divide them into lots of short notes. Effetti take a single note and do something emotional on that note. One of the things you can do is just crescendo or diminuendo on a single note. And these effetti become increasingly important as we go through our period and into the early 17th century. There's also a difference that passaggi delight the ear. They sound impressive. Effetti touch the heart. They're emotional. Both of them add, and this is a really important concept, grazia, grace. They make the performance more graceful, just as gestures make the performance more graceful. And this idea of grazia, not just doing it, but doing it gracefully, beautifully, very important Renaissance concept. So Ortiz in the middle of the 16th century, he says different ways that you can make ensembles and in particular that you can do ornaments and his ornaments are essentially passaggi. He calls them glosas in Spanish, glossing a simple version with something more complex, replacing one long note with many short notes. And how do you perform this? Well you could have free fantasia by yourself, you can imitate the sound of polyphony on one instrument, perhaps more obviously a keyboard instrument, a lute or a harp, but even a so-called melodic instrument can imitate the idea of polyphony on a melodic instrument. Ortiz is doing that already and of course looking way ahead we would think of the Bach unaccompanied violin partitas. Polyphony on a single instrument. Also there's a way of playing with two instruments which is very similar to something happening much earlier in the Renaissance, which the Spanish call consonancias, harmonies, y redobles, short notes. The harpsichord plays a few harmonies and then the solo instrument whizzes around with some fast notes and then you carry on like that and that lets you improvise completely freely with two people. You can have a cantus firmus, so you've got a fixed melody which goes slowly and the soloist plays fast notes over the top of that. That fixed melody might have a regular rhythm and a repeating structure which Ortiz calls tenore. We would call it a ground bass, which is what it was called later on in the 17th century. But in the Renaissance they've still got this idea that the structural foundation of their music is the tenor, whereas in the Baroque we think of the structural foundation as being the bass. 
And Ortiz also says you can take a complete madrigal and you can make passaggi over that. You can ornament any one of the voices while the harpsichord plays the whole thing. Or you can add your own extra voice. So part of ornamentation is not just adding activity, but it's adding another layer of polyphony. And then what's called, <laughs> amusingly for us, alabastarda, um, you don't just say on one part, you roam freely through the whole polyphonic texture, um, ornamenting whatever you like, putting in extra parts, just doing anything. And of course this suits particularly an instrument like the viola da gamba, for which Ortiz was principally writing, because it has such a wide range as an instrument. Caccini is talking about grazia, especially, crescendo on single notes, and he talks about the effetti, these ornaments on a single note. He talks about aria, which is a ground bass, and he talks about passaggi, especially putting them into a repeated, perhaps final phrase. Interestingly, he does not use passaggi at cadences. We tend to think of ornamenting the heck out of the cadence, but actually, during the late Renaissance, the tendency is to leave the cadences plain and put um, rather effetti on the cadences, not passaggi. And finally, very quickly, those modern day obsessions, if you go to any early music chat group or you go to the pub between rehearsals, the early musicians will be arguing about these things which back in the time were not argued about anything like as much. They're side issues. We've been distracted by them. Temperament. Whatever you're playing, you need some kind of temperament. It's not because your instrument is faulty. It's not because early music is weird. We always need temperament because pure intervals do not add up. If we take a third, C, E, another third, E, G sharp, and another third, G sharp, B sharp. That B sharp is not an octave from the C we started with. Thirds do not add up into octaves. Fifths do not add up into octaves. You can't go round the circle of fifths and arrive at a pure third. None of these intervals actually add up in the right way. We always have to adjust them. And the question is, how? And different periods, different countries, different answers, especially in polyphony um, and in our period here, we're having to consider the balance between what sounds good in a melody and what sounds good when the voices come together in harmony. And as they prioritised harmony more and more, they liked to have pure major thirds, they accepted narrowed fifths, and they use what we call quarter comma mean tone. The main result that you need to know about that is that there's so-called big and small semitones. Uh, so when we go from D to E flat, we're changing letter name, that's a big semitone. When we go from E flat to E natural, not changing the letter name, that's a small semitone. Those two steps are not the same size. We're going to do this very, very quickly and very practically at our weekend by tuning the keyboards into quarter comma mean tone and then listening and playing together with that. And when we encounter a special situation, a challenge or a problem, we'll discuss it a little bit further. Pitch. Yet there were local variations. Every court, every church had its own subtly different pitch. Um, there also were big historical changes. Uh, the book is The History of A by Bruce Haynes. Also, there are these big transpositions, chiavette, that we talked about before, and people did a lot of transposing back then. It's a good skill to have today as well. One of their ways to alter the pitch was to change instrument. So there's a lovely story of Isabella d'Este, uh, so the princess in an Italian court. She likes to make music, she likes to sing, to her viola da gamba. But she asks the instrument maker to make her a bigger viola da gamba because the one she's got 
has too high a pitch for her voice. So a bigger instrument will sound at a lower pitch even when she thinks she's playing the same notes and that will suit her lower voice. Lutes also changed instruments. They didn't transpose. You pick up another lute at a lower pitch. And that worst of all modern day obsessions, vibrato, we're not going to talk about that at all. The only thing I'm going to say is do it at the end of long notes. Interestingly, period sources talk about it very, very little, and the modern obsession is very, very distorted. So we've been talking about the old and the new, the old style of the Renaissance, which is going to become the new music of the early Baroque. What the Renaissance assumed, what they already had, and what they were developing. We've emphasised our approach of historically informed performance, using historical information, as much of it as we can assemble, to guide our performance. This idea that things were different back then, we must expect them to be different. And that we are looking at the period context, what they had, what they assumed, and their aims, what they were trying to develop. The context is rhetoric. Music is based on text. Music is to move the passions of the audience. The context is tactus, this regular steady beat, about one second each way. The context is polyphony, all the voices are equally important. The aim, it's the rhetorical aims, to teach, delight and move the passions. And there's a gradual shift there's a tendency for early Renaissance and even earlier music to be very focused on teaching. A lot of religious music, it's there to convey a text and improve the moral standing of the listeners. In our period, there's a lot of focus on delight. This is part of grazia and pleasing the listener's ears. But an increasing focus, which really becomes important in the early 17th, on the idea of moving the audience's passions, not expressing our emotions, of changing how the audience feel. How do we do that? We do it with our clear delivery. We delight their ears with passaggi and harmony, and we move the passions with dissonances and effetti. We're helped by action, gesture, and all the changes of sound quality, of the tone quality of your voice, everything additional to the raw notes and raw words, action. And we're helped by science, that our earthly music is connected through our human nature to some mysterious cosmic power and perfection. And just outside our period, this is summed up so beautifully by Striccio in the prologue to Monteverdi's Orfeo, singing to the golden harp, I, la musica, music herself. Music can usually charm your ears. But like this, if I use the sonorous harmony of the cosmic music, the music of the spheres, the lyre of heaven, I can touch your hearts, I can change your emotions, I can captivate souls. Thank you. There is a lot of material there and I hope you'll find that the um, recording will be a useful reference. I'm hoping that you will recognise these concepts and remember, ah yeah, we talked about the music of the spheres. That was an interesting historical and theoretical idea. In our practical weekend, I'll try to show you how we put these theoretical concepts, how we actually put them to work in a very practical way.